introduce Jim Dyers, who's a community building expert from Seattle and is visiting Wyndham City. Hi, Jim, how are you going? Good day, it's great to be in Wyndham. Great yeah. to, be, to, to see you as well. Um, what's the benefit of building community strengths rather than need analyses? Oh boy, I think, we, uh, I think the problem is over time we've, we've done more and more focusing on community needs and it's often done by well-meaning professionals who want to figure out, you know, we often say professionals need needs. Uh, so, you know, in their efforts to help communities, oftentimes the first thing they do is do a needs assessment to figure out what are all the problems in the community and how can we be most helpful. And the problem is over time, uh, communities have started to internalize that map of themselves and they're starting to always focusing on what they're missing and always looking outside the community for all the answers. And um, uh, the problem is we've forgotten about the other part of the community, which are all the community strengths. And I think that focusing on the community strengths is really the basis for community action, it's the basis for bringing communities together, uh, and it's the basis for doing some things that uh, agencies don't do so well. And what is the role of local government and community service organisations in building neighbour power? I think the first thing, the first role is to uh, realize that often inadvertently in our, in our efforts to help communities, we're harming the very communities we're trying to help. And I think some of the ways we harm communities uh, is that we're organized into silos so that every agency is organized uh, according to its mission, very narrow mission, its narrow function, um, and uh, tries to involve the community around their own mission or function. So we've uh, separated the community. We've, we've created one set of silos for young people, another set for old people, another set for new immigrants and refugees, another set for people with disabilities, and you can't build community in silos, right? Uh, it's kind of a question of who's serving whom when our communities are having to organize themselves the way the agencies are organized, rather than agencies organize themselves the way communities are organized, in more of a place-based kind of way. Um, a second way, I think, is that um, agencies, professionals are always driving the agenda. They're always reaching out to the community around their own priorities or what they're getting funded to prioritize. And it leaves very little time or space for the community to organize around what's important to them. Right? And uh, again, uh, agencies tend to focus on communities as places with great needs, so they've forgotten about the incredible strengths that communities have. Uh, and that's also impossible to involve communities if they aren't bringing anything to the table, if, they aren't, if the communities and the agencies aren't recognizing the strengths that communities can bring. So that's the first step, it's just kind of doing no harm. A second step, I think, is removing some of the barriers that have been created by agencies to community engagement. And some of those barriers are health and safety, liability. Everywhere I go, there are community groups that want to do projects, they want to build a community garden, they want to build a playground, and they get to council and they're told all the reasons why they can't do it. Uh, it's very legitimate reasons, but instead of figuring out how do we say yes, too often times the automatic answer is no, here's why you can't do it. Um, I think other barriers that we've created are just that oftentimes staff are working the same hours that people in the community are working, so it's kind of hard to engage with the community. That too often times our work's done in a centralized way where we have to centralized decision making and people tend to be active the closer you involve them to where they live. So we need to figure out how, how do we better decentralize our facilities, our staff, our decisions uh, so that people can be engaged in those. Um, it's about um, not having cookie cutter solutions for communities but and, and one size fits all solutions but really recognizing what's unique about each place and the character of the people and allowing the communities to kind of shape their places uh, and their actions in the way that's appropriate for their community. And then I think a third thing um, agencies can do is help rebuild the capacity of communities. Um, I was really glad to hear there's some leadership training going on here. I think that's really important to give communities the, the tools to be effective leaders in their communities to give communities tools like translation, interpret interpretive services, so they can reach out to the increasingly diverse community and really be inclusive of everybody. Um, it's about um, helping associations network with each other, realizing no one association includes everybody, and helping groups connect with people, particularly who are uh, different than themselves, and, bring, and come together and create a common vision for their community. Um, it's about providing venues other than meetings for people to get engaged. Uh, that's the worst way to get people engaged through meetings. So providing opportunities for people to come together in social events, projects, ways for people to start to rebuild those relationships, which is what community is all about. Uh, and then once people start building the relationships, then they're more likely to come to some of the meetings. 
Um, it's about sharing stories about uh, the great things that are going on in community because there are some fantastic projects happening here. There's some fast, fantastic examples of people supporting each other, but I would bet they seldom get in the major news media. So it's uh, what role can council play in helping to get those stories out to kind of inspire people about what's possible, give people a sense of what they could do themselves. Okay, then, and um, what can local government, uh, local government and its partners do to support community-driven initiatives? Well, I think a big part of it is how do we lead by stepping back and make some room for the community. Uh, that too often times, I, I often say that I think it's hardest to get the community engaged in places like Australia where you have better government than we have in the States. Uh, because government does, people over time kind of think, well, my job is to pay my taxes and government's job is to take care of me. And uh, I think government needs to step back and make some room for communities to do what they do best. Uh, I have, uh, um, I was trained as a community organizer and the iron rule of community organizing is never do for people what they can do for themselves. So I think it's stepping back and thinking what does government do best and really making sure we're doing a great job on that, particularly with community input, but also recognizing what community does best and, and making it possible for communities to step up and do what they do best. So from what you're saying then, there isn't just one off approach to making this happen, it's going to vary from one community to the next, isn't it? There's no question. I think the basic principles are the same that you need to follow everywhere, but I think the approach will be different in different places. And it's really about, uh, if it's going to be genuinely community driven, to make sure that um, uh, you've got the whole community engaged, it's not just the usual suspects, that really is the community. So helping people connect within the community. It's about um, not um, uh, have, empowering community just around a specific agenda, but allowing the community to really set its own agenda and, and drive its own agenda uh, is really important. Okay, great. Thank you very much for talking to us this afternoon. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Yeah.